Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping tips. Uh, please make sure your video is off and your mics are muted. We also ask that you please hold any of your questions and comments till the end, at which time you may unmute yourself uh, or place your questions or comments in the chat box. Lastly, the CME information today will be displayed during the presentation on this first and last slide, and then I will periodically place it in the chat box as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, so today, our speaker is Dr. Galavani from United Arab Emirates University, who will be presenting his topic on molecular imaging and cancer medicine. Dr. Galavani is current, sorry, currently holds a primary appointment as professor at the College of Medicine and Health Sciences in the United Arab Emirates and as an advisor in the provost office at the United Arab Emirates University. He earned his medical degree and PhD in clinical neurosurgery at the University of Tartu in Estonia. For the past three decades, his research activities were focused on the development of novel molecular imaging agents, as well as molecular genetic imaging approaches for the diagnosis of various diseases in adult and pediatric patients using CT, PET, MRI, MRS, and optical spectroscopy. Um, in his role as pr uh, principal investigator and lead team member on multiple NIH-funded grants, he laid the foundation for a new field of molecular genetic imaging for which he has been awarded numerous honors and awards. Dr. Galavani has authored and co-authored over 200 peer-reviewed articles and holds many patents that have contributed greatly to the fields of research and clinical medicine. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Galavani for his discussion on molecular imaging and cancer medicine. Uh, thank you for this uh, kind introduction. I'll uh, hope I can uh, stand up for this uh, of uh, high uh, accolades. Um, I think that uh, it is important to note that I also hold uh, a professorial a position at the uh, Winston University, Carmanos Cancer uh, Institute, uh, continue my appointment there as well. Um, over the past uh, 30 years, I've been uh, working within uh, this uh, field, starting from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, where I've got my fellowship in neuro-oncology, uh, followed by uh, almost 12 years of uh, work at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, uh, followed by the Carmine Cancer Institute at Wayne State, and uh, now uh, helping the uh, local community and uh, uh, university at uh, the United Arab Emirates build uh, similar programs. Um, what I would like to discuss with you today, or present to you today, is the following uh, topics. Uh, first, we're going to cover radiotheranostics uh, with an example of cancer, of prostate carcinomas, immunotheragnostics, and epigenetic imaging and therapy, uh, both uh, exemplified uh, in applications to, for glioma and diagnosis and therapy. And overall, um, the type of presentation you're going to hear from me today will cover uh, clinical translational and uh, late translational um, and most recent applications of molecular imaging and uh, theragnostics uh, in the clinical realm. Uh, first, I would like to emphasize that uh, the uh, approaches to theragnostics, which means uh, therapy and diagnosis joined as part of the unified approach uh, have been developing over the past uh, several decades. Um, and currently, this is uh, the presentation I'm going to give you covers uh, recently approved FDA approved approaches that make it a mainstream uh, approach uh, in uh, clinical management of uh, these types of cancers, including in particular prostate carcinoma. And one of the theranostic approaches that has been developed over the past uh, decade uh, actually started at the late 1990s. Uh, the approach I'm going to describe has been pioneered by a friend of mine and good colleague, Martin Pomper at Johns Hopkins, who noticed that uh, glutamate carboxypeptidase known as nalidase, is highly uh, overexpressed uh, also in the prostate uh, carcinomas, but there it's known under a different uh, name called the prostate-specific membrane antigen. And uh, it is the same enzyme that has been targeted uh, by pharmaceutical industry in the brain for several uh, decades prior to that. 
and the ligands that would bind to glutamate carboxypeptidase are exactly the same ligands, and those are based on urea, for example, and the urea complex is over here, this uh, part of the molecule. You can see the uh, two nitrogens, uh, NHs, and one. Uh, 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 oxygen connected to the carbon in between. So uh, these uh, structures are in the base of all the inhibitors uh, of uh, glutamate carboxypeptidase that have been developed and uh, translated to the clinic. And it's not surprising that the radio labeled derivatives of these compounds uh, could be used uh, to target prostate-specific membrane antigen, again, which is the same enzyme, glutamate carboxypeptidase, both with uh, the aim of visualizing the sites of expression, uh, as well as targeting radiotherapeutic ligands to that receptor, which apparently later upon binding to the uh, ligand uh, internalizes, at least in part. Uh, targeting of PSMA receptor can be achieved also using either small peptides or even monoclonal antibodies that also could be either radio labeled with diagnostic purposes or with uh, uh, the short lived uh, radionuclides that are either gamma emitters or uh, emitting positrons for positron emission tomography, or they could be radio labeled with uh, beta emitting or gamma emitting particles. Uh, so that uh, the delivery and the dose accumulation of these radiopharmaceuticals for therapeutic purposes will provide local uh, radiopharmacological type of effect. And the dose administered to the cell, especially to the nucleus, will result in the cell death. Um, these are one of the first images of, of uh, the uh, prostate carcinomas that have been targeted with the gallium a uh, label gallium 68 a uh, labeled uh, compound. Uh, these are actually from California, from UCLA. Uh, these um, uh, compounds have been uh, extensively developed both in the United States and uh, in Germany. Um, and actually there were several different types of compounds developed to date. Uh, all of them vary uh, by virtue of either the linker group that uh, adds uh, the uh, specificity or uh, the um, pharmacological, pharmacokinetic, I would say, specificity and along, prolongs the time of circulation of this compound, uh, reduces the binding to proteins, or on the contrary, increases the binding of uh, this compound to protein for radiotherapeutic purposes. So these compounds have been developed for quite a while, but these are the first uh, images of uh, the uh, prostate carcinoma patient, uh, where the um, on the right-hand side, you see quite negative extraprostatic disease spread, but uh, on the uh, PET and CT images, there is clear cut um, localization of extraprostatic disease with metastasis to the uh, sacrum, as well as the pelvic lymph node indicated uh, by the blue arrows. Also, the primary lesion is very well uh, defined in those images, despite the fact that the excretion of this compound happens partially through the urine and the patient should void prior to uh, performance of this uh, imaging uh, studies. So uh, it is noteworthy that um, the magnitude of accumulation and the number of lesions that could be detected by uh, these uh, technologies using the uh, PET-CT with the PSMA targeted compound uh, reveal uh, that the magnitude of binding as well as the number of lesions identified by this approach correlates with the uh, PSA measured in blood. So if the PSA is the uh, biomarker that could be used to assess the magnitude of disease and the um, uh, overall volume of the PSA uh, producing uh, tumor mass in the body, then a PET CT with the PSMA targeted compound can localize uh, uh, the lesions and establish uh, uh, not only their localization, but also could be used to measure uh, the magnitude of accumulation in each lesion so that this information could be used for optimization of radiopharmaceutical 
dose as administered uh, to the patient. So here you can also see that uh, this approach uh, almost makes the conventional bone scan uh, with either technetium or gallium uh, an absolute. Okay, so there has been a very nice paper referenced in the uh, in the lower uh, part of this slide, and for most of the uh, presentation uh, slides, I will uh, provide this type of information. So, if you would like to go and read the paper, you have the reference here. Uh, so, it literally makes the um, bone scan obsolete because, in addition to the information. For that bone scan and the PET uh, CT scan with the PSMA targeting agent provides for the bone lesions. It also, for the PSMA PET CT, provides uh, uh, quite a lot of information uh, about the extra uh, osseous lesions, uh, metastatic lesion to the soft tissues as well. Uh, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of uh, approaches uh, that have been developed using either gamma or especially beta and now even alpha particle producing uh, radionuclides that are chelated uh, to the same uh, binding ligand that is used for imaging with PET. And here one can uh, use uh, all the tricks of radiobiology and radiation dosimetry, um, as well as uh, the imaging uh, results in terms of accumulation in individual lesions to optimize the dosimetry and uh, uh, of individual type of nuclides that have uh, different profiles for the local uh, dose distribution as well as the systemic dose distribution. So here are uh, two mainstream uh, radionuclides that have been used uh, to deliver uh, radiation doses uh, to individual lesions, where lutetium-177 and actinium-225. Uh, some of the clinical trials that have been recently described uh, as very, very effective uh, provide combination of these uh, uh, ligands uh, in sequential manner. So the, you can read about this uh, here. Most importantly, uh, one can use uh, PET imaging for both, as I mentioned, not only for uh, radiation dosimetry di di diagnostics and radiation dosimetry optimization, but also for the follow-up studies to assess the efficacy of uh, radiotherapeutic interventions. Uh, here, kind of at this stage, I would like to summarize it that a PSMA pad would be used for diagnosis as well as the dosimetry, and then one could administer uh, the uh, radiopharmaceutical targeted to the PSMA, like the lutetium-177 PSMA-671. Uh, this is the main type of uh, uh, compound that is uh, uh, currently approved um, uh, by the uh, uh, FDA under the IND to be uh, uh, administered uh, in the clinical trials and then reassess the status of these lesions using PSMA PET again to determine which ones are actually uh, eliminated and those that are persist. So uh, I'll provide you now with the, some of the latest information about the efficacy of this approach in a phase three study that uh, has been uh, in the beginning of the year presented uh, uh, at the ASCO meeting. It's uh, the trial called Vision and the trial number uh, is provided here, um, which assessed in uh, uh, these uh, patients with the prostate carcinoma, especially the recurrent gastric resistant prostate carcinoma. Um, uh, these approach where lutetium uh, PSMA was uh, used uh, to target and uh, ablate the uh, cancer cells. Most importantly is uh, one thing needs to be noted that um, some of the cancer cells that may have low levels of expression of this receptor uh, can also be targeted because of so-called bystander effect or cancer cell and neighboring cell death, so-called bystander effect. So in that trial, um, uh, there were uh, patients that uh, included, uh, that had previous treatment, both for uh, more than one uh, androgen receptor pathway inhibitor, one or two taxane regimens, and this protocol permitted the standard of care planned before the randomization 
excluding chemotherapy, immunotherapy, or prior uh, radiotherapy, uh, they had a clock performance status of up to two and life expectancy of more than six years. And uh, they should, uh, the patient would have uh, uh, positive uh, lesions on PET CT with the gallium PSMA ligand. Uh, there was two to one randomization in favor of the uh, protocol that combined the standard of care with the lutetium 177 PSMA uh, versus the protocol of standard of care determined by the physician, uh, which was administered along without the radiotherapy. So, um, long story short, uh, there was treatment. Uh, uh, administered as indicated here every eight weeks uh, and uh, every 12 weeks there was a follow-up um, through a blinded independent central review. Needless to say, it's a multi-center trial. And uh, what was important that uh, they acquired uh, data uh, from 831 patients uh, in which uh, more than 550 patients were 551 uh, got the combination treatment versus uh, 280 with the uh, standard of care alone. And you can see what type of treatment were uh, typical um, treatments were administered, uh, both as combination as an alone treatment as well. So uh, result of the study were quite uh, uh, astonishingly positive uh, that actually demonstrated that uh, for the castration resistant prostate cancer, the time uh, from randomization is shown here in month and event-free probability on the y-axis uh, shows that uh, this patient, uh, the, the median kind of uh, uh, event-free survival or recurrent free survival was uh, uh, 15 uh, months versus 11. That was the standard of care. And uh, radiological um, improvement in terms of the lesions uh, was significantly improved as well uh, with a median uh, 8.7 to 3.4 uh, month, um, which indicates that uh, compared to the standard of care of these uh, combination therapy with the radiotheranostic approach with molecular imaging, driving the radiotherapeutic targeting was quite effective. And here's some, uh, you know, uh, take home messages. Uh, that um, sort of summarize this part of the presentation. Most importantly, it proves that the radiotheranostic method in which molecular imaging is used um, uh, to both determine the localization of lesions for staging as well, and for most optimal uh, dosimetry uh, to individualize the uh, regimens, radiotherapeutic regimens and doses to uh, the patients. Uh, plays a significant role. It can be also used to overcome um, the resistance to conventional chemoradiotherapies uh, because uh, it's a sort of currently it's a last resort uh, for uh, treatment of uh, at least BSMA positive uh, uh, prostate carcinomas. Uh, let me switch gears at this stage and uh, move to another uh, very uh, actively kind of developing and recently emerged uh, approach to treatment of uh, uh, cancers in which again, the uh, molecular imaging is just starting to be implemented um, uh, in uh, selection and guiding as well as monitoring the efficacy of treatment. And this is the immunotherapies of cancer and specifically uh, uh, therapies to using the uh, chimeric antigen uh, receptor expressing uh, T cells that are genetically modified to express those receptors. And here's the cartoon, which I hope you will remember a bit to kind of uh, spice things up here. Um, the approach requires um, uh, harvesting of the patient's own or donor's uh, T cells uh, in the tissue compatible, HLA compatible manner. And uh, genetic modification of uh, these T cells with the chimeric uh, antigen receptor, um, uh, that the structure of which I will describe in a moment. And then um, upon the modification and the proliferation of uh, the T cell population that expresses this chimeric antigen receptor and this 
antigen receptor is uh, targeted against the antigen that is expressed by the cancer cells, obviously. And uh, they are being expo uh, the uh, proliferated and uh, expanded population then is reinfused into patient um, with the aim uh, and the intention that these T cells will uh, distribute throughout the body, find the cancer uh, cells and attack those by virtue of expressing of these uh, chimeric antigen receptors. However, uh, you can imagine that uh, this is all done sort of blindly, uh, blindly in a sense that the fate of the infused cells, their distribution and specifically localization in the tumor, uh, especially if it's a metastatic disease, um, is unknown. And you cannot go and biopsy each individual lesion to assess the efficacy of targeting for prediction of response uh, adequacy of the dose of the cells administered, and so on. So it really calls for a non-invasive uh, type of imaging, uh, which we call molecular genetic imaging that I founded uh, a long time ago in early 1990s. So the chimeric antigen receptors have evolved, and the approach to therapy with these uh, uh, genetically modified T cells expressing these receptors have evolved. And typically, though, have uh, a hypervariable regions or the antibodies uh, genetically encoded uh, to be linked through a hinge region with a uh, uh, CD3 uh, domain, the receptor, the uh, T cell receptor. Um, and uh, initially, those were produced uh, uh, with the, in linkage with CD3 alone, and or with the co-stimulatory domains of other co-stimulatory uh, uh, with the domains of other co-stimulatory uh, receptors, such as, for example, the CD28. Those studies have been conducted in uh, mid to late to uh, 1990s, uh, including in my laboratory. So subsequently, combinations of co-stimulatory domain and the uh, administration, systemic administration of cytokines has evolved as the mainstream approach for uh, immunomodulation or immunovaccination and immunotherapy uh, with uh, these types of CAR T cells. So what is the molecular genetic imaging approach that has been developed that could be used for monitoring these types of uh, T cell therapies? Um, one of the approaches is using the uh, reporter gene, so-called reporter gene, and it's a well-known uh, enzyme from the herpes uh, simplex virus 1 uh, thymidine kinase. That's the enzyme that the herpes viruses um, uh, are expressing uh, to uh, synthesize their DNA, and uh, uh, in particular for phosphorylation of thymidine. And uh, you might well know that uh, the drugs such as acyclovir, gencyclovir, which are DNA chain terminators, uh, are being used for treatment of those infections, the um, herpes viral infections. And uh, those uh, are effective treatments because they are converted to monophosphates and then inhibit uh, polymerase synthase as well as um, uh, generate a lot of uh, uh, terminated DNA uh, chains, uh, and that actually inhibits the viral proliferation. But if you put that gene in a gene therapeutic approach into cancer, for example, uh, you will induce the cancer cell death because those proliferating cells will uh, accumulate a lot of uh, uh, unfinished, uh, non-elongated uh, DNA chains, which will activate uh, the P53, P21 pathway and induce apoptosis. Now, uh, in this case, we're not inducing apoptosis, we're using uh, the uh, HSVTK uh, enzyme as a reporter enzyme and gene encoding to it will be introduced in the cell in parallel with the introduction of the uh, CAR T uh, cell receptor, the chimeric antigen receptor, uh, in one expression cassette, in one gene expression cassette, uh, and their levels will be co-expressed. Now, these uh, cells that are expressing <clears throat> the reporter uh, gene and uh, product, which is this enzyme, will be able to phosphorylate uh, 
the radio labeled a cyclothymidin or a cycloguanosine, or in this case, the fluorarabino modified nucleoside analogs. And just because they are phosphorylated, uh, they won't be able to exit uh, across the cell membrane because they are negatively charged, and they will be effectively uh, incorporated into elongating DNA, especially if it's a uh, um, T cell or, or uh, the um, uh, tumor cell. But because the levels of uh, molar levels of this compound, radio labeled compounds, are meniscus, they're kind of nanomolar concentrations, they don't induce any therapeutic effect or they don't have toxic effect because of such uh, low doses, although radio labeled uh, um, uh, dose radionuclide dose is quite high, the molar dose comparable to that is very, very low. So basically, uh, if you take those T cells that carry uh, the uh, reporter gene, inject those into systemic circulation, they would localize uh, to the tumor or accumulate in the uh, immune checkpoint organs. And upon later, several days later, you can administer a radio tracer intravenously the radio tracer will accumulate only in those regions where are populated by these T cells that are expressing the reporter gene. Which means that now you can localize those and compare their localization, the densities of infiltrating cells, to the known lesions of the cancer you're trying to target. So, um, We've been working from this uh, approach for many, many years. And in this case, uh, this is one of the uh, papers published in 2001 in Neoplasia, which uh, utilized co-expression cassette. Um, it's a retroviral vector, which was used to transduce lymphocytes, in which case uh, herpes viral thymidine kinase infusion with green fluorescent protein to simplify uh, fax mediated selection of cells was introduced into the uh, T cells. So we could demonstrate that using anti CD3 antibody, we could uh, activate the response um, of the cells and the level of the expression of this reported gene because this gene was uh, put under the control of uh, an artificial element that is sensitive to the nuclear factor activated T cells or NFAT that is activated when the T cell receptor is activating. And the T cell receptor is activating when the T cell forms an immunosynapse with the target antigen. So basically when the process of activation of T cells happens, when the T cell recognize the cancer cell expressing the antigen that it is sensitized to. So you can see that with the uh, co-stimulation, CD3 and CD28 uh, co-stimulation antibodies, uh, these T cells express significantly higher levels of uh, uh, the uh, reporter gene as uh, measured by the level of accumulation of radio tracer, as well as measured by um, the IL-2 production as a manifestation of activation levels. So it is important to know that in this model, and we took a mouse and implanted a different type of clones of uh, cells that had uh, different levels of activation. Uh, uh, and upon the challenge of uh, these uh, mice expressing, uh, carrying these uh, type of clones of uh, B cell uh, lymphomas that had those uh, artificial transduced um, um, a T cell lymphoma, sorry, that had artificially transduced uh, with this reporter. If these uh, were stimulated with anti CD3 and CD28 antibodies, the magnitude of a signal after this activation was significantly higher compared to uh, that achieved with the control antibody. And obviously, we use the wild type non transduced as well as the constantly constitutively transduced positive controls, which didn't change upon the challenge with the uh, antibodies. So uh, the ability to visualize the T cell activation was demonstrated in vivo for the first time already 20 years ago. So this demonstration uh, was uh, so profound that it stimulated uh, the development of the whole field. Uh, 
And uh, as the result, both the NTAD activated the reporters and constitutively expressed reporters for tracking just the cell movement uh, were developed um, over the past 20 years. And I'll give you some examples of how that was translated into the clinic. Um, you can see some of the conclusions from this study. I'm not going to spend time to recite that. You can read those, but the take home message is that uh, we demonstrated already 20 years ago that one could visualize non invasively uh, not only the localization of the T cell, but also the status of their activation. Um, we cemented this results in a subsequent study, used the study by Kern et al. that was published in Nature Biotech um, a couple of years uh, after the initial publication, demonstrating that not only we can visualize the localization and trafficking of these uh, uh, artificially modified T cells, but that if you're using the non-modified cells, uh, and uh, not genetically modified by the T cell receptor, but you can uh, also use uh, vaccines and a kind of uh, dendritic cell vaccines and expose those to the T cells. The sensitized cells are homing to tumors in the HLA depending manner. So if uh, you compare the magnitude of accumulation of these T cells in the subcutaneously localized tumors and those uh, EVD PSCLs that were injected into this mouse, focusing uh, them to the tumors, uh, demonstrated that they are localizing to uh, either uh, allogeneic HLA matched or uh, autologous EVD cells, much higher than the mismatched or negative at all. So this demonstrates that the system that we developed is quite sensitive and can uh, differentiate between uh, the approaches that may use not only the patient's own T cells, for example, if they are immunosuppressed or depleted, or there are other contraindications, why not to harvest those cells from the patient? One can use the donor, HLA matched donor T cells to develop these approaches uh, for therapy of uh, patients that are actually matching uh, uh, but have cancer. Uh, we move further to the next stage in clinical translation and uh, started if with the sensitive, uh, if the method that we developed was sensitive not only, in, not only in mice, but could be also applied in the, uh, on the clinical equipment uh, using clinically relevant um, uh, uh, type of uh, uh, systems, and we studied it in uh, um, similar approaches in primates. Here are the images before and after injection of genetically modified reporter gene expressing uh, T cells, autologous T cells in a rhesus macaque. Uh, you can see that uh, the images are quite uh, impressive here. They also demonstrate the areas where uh, the radio tracer itself is um, <clears throat> cleared through through the liver as well the hepatobiliary and through the uh, renal system here's the bladder here's the kidneys so obviously this known normal distribution of radioactivity and the pathway of its elimination um, uh, needs to be known in order to interpret these images so uh, these are the <coughs> excuse me these are the, uh, the macaques uh, one and the same macaque actually, which was uh, imaged with the fluorine labeled uh, fluoroethyl parabenofurazil, thymidine, FEAU, before administration of a reporter gene uh, labeled T cells. And these are images at 90 minutes and seven days post administration of the T cells. Now, it's important to note that T cells are not labeled with the radio label. So the T cells are administered, and then following that, the radio tracer is administered intravenously. So it distributes everywhere, and then also would accumulate, for example, in the sites which accumulated uh, the T cells. Uh, it is noteworthy that uh, we have seen, uh, it's an anecdotal type of uh, interesting story, we have seen these a little lesion over here in the thigh and the muscle and the gluteal muscle of this monkey, and uh, we were quite puzzled of what was going on. And apparently, uh, later our uh, 
that nurse has uh, noted and confessed that actually the animal has uh, jerked its leg when it was injected uh, with the sedative uh, prior to the inhalation anesthesia that was uh, given to the animal over the course of two hours once we were doing uh, the study, conducting the study. And you could see that even the slight uh, trauma and inflammation caused by this event was visualized by uh, the localization of these uh, non-specific localization of these T cells. Um, let me see what's uh, going on. No, that's wrong. Okay, so next slide. Uh, what is important is that uh, in uh, two of these animals that we studied, uh, we also did seven days study after uh, the injection of T cells and also have visualized their localization in the uh, axillary and uh, lymph nodes uh, and uh, somewhere in the area of the parotid gland. Um, we figured out that there was a nonspecific uh, inflammatory process going on in these animals. Uh, and that was uh, also quite revealing that we can probably translate this uh, results into the clinic in humans. So subsequently, a colleague of mine um, at uh, uh, Stanford, uh, who moved uh, from UCLA while we were developing uh, these type of approaches, I was developing that at Memorial Sloan Kettering. He was at the time at uh, UCLA, and later I moved to MD Anderson, he moved to Stanford. Uh, Sam Gambier, who unfortunately has uh, left this world a year and a half ago, also succumbed to cancer. Um, but he has developed a next stage translation to the clinic using the radio-labeled version of the acyclaguanazine, which is slightly different radio tracer, but in principle, it works exactly the same way. Um, it is phosphorylated by herpes virus kinase and retained inside the cell that's generating uh, signals. So the more gene expression or more density of the infiltrated T cells in the tissue, the higher the signal you're going to get. And uh, here it was co-expressed with the IL-13 zidikine uh, uh, and uh, to target the gliomas. And in this case, uh, the uh, T cells were administered in a manner uh, that actually followed initial kind of re excuse me, resection of uh, gliomas that we're waiting for potential recurrence, uh, taking uh, at that stage exhausting uh, therapeutic uh, um, uh, standard of care approaches. And then they were sensitizing uh, those T cells to the glioma cells, engineering them, and then implanting a uh, direct catheter like into a Meyer reservoir and delivering those T cells uh, through the semi reservoir into the uh, uh, tumor, into the area of recurrent tumor. They were imaging with the fluoric and cyclure before this procedure and several days after this procedure to see if there is any increased localization uh, of radiopharmaceutical inside uh, the area of glioma. So here's the result, this is the pre and post images on the MRI of this uh, post-operative recurrent glioma uh, growth. And uh, this is corresponding uh, image of uh, FHBG. This is fluorogansaclavir uh, analog that is demonstrating some degree of accumulation, non-specific accumulation because of the blood brain barrier. Permeability obviously is higher in the gliomas compared to the brain. But after the administration of T cells, the T cells that stick in the area of the oma, they ex, uh, start proliferating locally. And uh, hopefully, we don't know that yet, but also inducing some cytotoxic activity and uh, uh, eliminating some of those glioma cells, uh, they also accumulate higher levels of uh, radio pharmaceutical, which is uh, accumulating there through presence of the reporter gene. So this is analysis of the histogram of the activity distribution uh, inside the tumor before and after administration of the T cells uh, following the scan sector, demonstrating that much higher levels of accumulation of radio pharmaceutical signifying uh, the accumulation of T cells in the uh, target tissue is quite obvious. So they also repeated that in other test patients here who are current disease, uh, 
uh, and uh, right after the surgical removal uh, of the um, uh, lesion at the surgical resection site, and also demonstrated that this uh, approach could potentially work. But uh, obviously, it needs to be now optimized to increase the retention of T cells and increase their cytotoxicity against cancer. Um, and this work now is enabling because, um, you know, it uh, reminds me of the famous passage from the great book, uh, right? You know, which one? That the blind uh, leading blind. Now, at least we are having some uh, uh, sense of sight and we can monitor what exactly we're doing in the brain with immunotherapies. Are the cells sticking to the tumor? Are they targeting the tumor? Are they proliferating in the tumor site? And using more conventional methods of imaging, we can also assess whether they are cytotoxically active. So, here's the um, comparison of pre and post levels of radio tracer accumulation, which is proportionate to the number of T cells in the area, certainly demonstrating in the majority of cases that there is significant improvement of increase of accumulation of radio tracer. Um, and uh, that hopefully is uh, going to be used in the future uh, to optimize the uh, immunotherapy of such a devastating disease as gliomas. Here are the conclusions and take home messages that molecular genetic reporter imaging with the entity specific or um, um, kind of maybe polyclonal type of T cells that are developed uh, against cancer, for example, through exposure of T cells to uh, dendritic cells transduced with the um, whole uh, tumor cell RNAs. These are types of studies that are going at, uh, undergoing in Duke and uh, Miami. There are many other approaches how to sensitize T cells against the cancer uh, antigens uh, that are used now and being tested. Those all approaches can be now monitored using the genetic modification of those T cells since they are anyways taken out of the body since they're still proliferated uh, outside of the body of the patient and then infused. These approaches can now be monitored in a theranostic oh, manner. Hello? 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 Uh, I will use the uh, last uh, 10, 15 minutes to uh, talk about yet another um, interesting approach that was developed in my laboratory. Um, the approaches for molecular imaging, for monitoring uh, the activity and uh, therapies targeted to uh, histone deacetylases. Uh, um, just to remind that histone deacetylases are the um, enzymes that are involved in epigenetic regulation. In particular, they modify the uh, interactions of DNA with the histone core proteins. Um, you just as a reminder, as a refresher, the, there are several so-called uh, uh, writers, readers, and erasers of uh, epigenetic uh, so code or encoding the interactions of the uh, DNA and the histone core protein. Uh, the DNA, as you know, is wound around the histone core proteins, which are uh, sort of counter to uh, intersecting barrels of those. And there are uh, several um, protein types that are involved uh, uh, in the structure of chromatin. And certain modifications are in uh, like uh, those that are increasing the uh, uh, electropositivity or lipophilicity of uh, the DNA, including the methylation of DNA. Those improve uh, the um, adherence of DNA to the, or uh, binding of the DNA to the histone core proteins, and they're suppressing the transcription of genes uh, from the segments of DNA, stretches of DNA that is interacting with the histones. Uh, yet, uh, phosphorylation and especially the uh, acetylation of histone core proteins, uh, those uh, make those histone core proteins, especially those tails of histone core protein that interact with DNA, uh, more electronegative. And since DNA is electronegative and the uh, histone core uh, protein tail becomes more electronegative, these are repelling each other. And this is the mechanism by which the DNA comes off 
from the histone core protein and is much readily transcribed into RNA. So this is the mechanism of regulation on the, uh, uh, of gene expression and for the shutdown of gene expression or modification of the magnitude of gene expression that happens at the histone core protein DNA interaction level. And that's dubbed epigenetic regulation. So uh, the, there are several classes, three classes, uh, actually four classes of enzymes. Uh, the HDAC11 is actually part of the class two, but uh, or class one, depending on which literature you're, you're reading. Um, and uh, class three enzymes are localized in the mitochondria. The class one and two, class one and the nucleus, class two shuttles between the nucleus and the cytoplasm and has, by virtue of their cytoplasmic and or mitochondrial localization, non-chromatin type of activities. They can deacetylate a variety of other proteins, statins, P53, uh, P21, et cetera, uh, HSPs, and or form as critical components of transcriptional complexes uh, or transcriptional repressor complexes, a uh, variety of uh, um, complexes with other proteins. So all of them basically, I'm not going to bore you with these details of catalytic activity, but they deacetylate lysines. If this is the lysine and it has an acetyl moiety on it, it deacetylates uh, the acetyl moiety, leaving this amine free and releasing the acetyl moiety. The acetyl transferases, on the contrary, are adding the lysine to uh, the uh, uh, adding the acetyl moiety to lysine in a more constitutive manner. They constantly do that. So the majority of uh, uh, reactions that regulate the level of uh, acetylation of proteins are mediated by the activity of deacetylases. So uh, once we know that the uh, key pharmacophore uh, is based on the uh, lysine, the leading group here is the one that uh, has been uh, studied the most uh, is determining the activity specificity for uh, the particular uh, types and the classes of uh, enzymes and they are even isotypes. So the methyl is deacetylated by all of the um, uh, classes, uh, but then adding the electronegative uh, atom like fluorine uh, to the methyl group from the mono to di to trifluoro, as well as increasing the size of uh, the living group will change its specificity either to class two enzymes, class two A in particular is uh, CF3, the trifluoromethyl group, and the larger ones can uh, drive the specificity towards the class three enzymes that are still capable of uh, removing uh, these acyl group from the uh, uh, lysine. So this is important just to know because the subsequent development of no uh, radiopharmaceuticals, uh, diagnostic radiopharmaceuticals was based on the knowledge of this biochemistry and uh, structural sort of uh, uh, activity at the enzyme uh, active site. So we developed uh, over the past year several uh, isotope specific and class specific compounds for imaging of particular uh, histone deacetylases. I'll give you some examples of that. Uh, in particular, here's the first compound called FAHA, fluoroacetyl hexamoic analyte, that is quite lipophilic, goes in and out of the cell, but in the cells, inside the cell, whether in the cytoplasm or especially in the nucleus, it's deacetylated uh, proportionate to the activity of the endogenous histone deacetylase class 2A. And the fluoroacetyl uh, is electronegative compound. It's not as well crossing the cell membrane and it's utilized as an inhibitor at the tracer level of the Krebs cycle. So it's being entrapped or at least it's not, ex uh, it's not leaving the cell as easily as the parent. The fate of non-label compounds is uh, inconsequential. But since we are using uh, tracer doses like nano, nanomoles, nanograms of this compound, pharmacological effect from the uh, diagnostic dose of this compound, as well as the uh, radiotherapeutic uh, doses, minuscule, 
So here's the example of translation of this approach, uh, which we went through from mice to rats, now to a non-human primate. Here is we demonstrated that we can visualize the level of epigenetic uh, activity of histone deacetylases in different structures of the brain in a rhesus macaque, notoriously localizing to the uh, cerebellum, as well as on the uh, brainstem and in the nucleus accumbens. Um, the areas that are known to overexpress the histone deacetylase uh, uh, class 2A, notoriously H.4 and H.5. H and we have demonstrated that uh, using increases, increasing doses of uh, uh, FDA approved inhibitor, uh, vorinostat or Saha, uh, subaroic um, hexanoic analyte, Subaroic acid hexanoic analyte, also, which was at the time developed at Sloan Kettering Cancer Center when I started developing this compound. Uh, increasing doses significantly shut down the uh, activity of the enzyme as manifested by decreased level of accumulation of radiopharmaceutical in the brain of rhesus macaques with increasing doses, which is important that we can actually de de develop the dose response curves for each of the structures of the brain and uh, demonstrate that the higher doses were required in those areas of the brain, as you can see on the left-hand side table, which actually um, expressed higher levels of enzymes. Uh, subsequently, this approach, especially with Faha or trifluorofaha, were uh, tested by other um, groups as well. And uh, several groups also validated the studies of this results demonstrating that uh, only a uh, fluoro labeled analog uh, was the one that accumulated in those um, tissues expressing high level of class 2A. And the other ones which were just labeled with carbon 11 uh, uh, on the living group or uh, on the other end of the molecule, those did not really uh, accumulate, which means that the enzymatic uh, D acetylation of this group and the accumulation of this group in the tissues that expressed high level of histone displaced class 3 activity was responsible indeed uh, for the signals that we observed uh, non-invasively using positron emission tomography. So how now that is applicable to cancer? Here's recently we published uh, uh, the following studies where we compared the level of accumulation of uh, this compound in U87MG glioma in the rat brain, as well as 9L sarcoma in the red brain. In both cases, uh, these uh, images demonstrate high level of accumulation localized in the sites of the tumor. Uh, so this is a sequential kind of uh, slices from the back to the front. And you can see that it can uh, visualize the localization with high precision as compared to the MRI. Now, uh, to validate that, obviously, we go through extensive uh, studies where we compare both the PET images, autoradiography, as well as the immunohistochemically detected levels of expression of enzymes, both in the area of the tumor, which is the top row, as well as in the uh, normal tissues uh, that are or structures in the brain, such as hippocampus, the contralateral hippocampus, where we also see quite a lot of accumulation of uh, this radio tracer. So uh, this is true both for the class 2As, class H.4 and H.5. Um, and uh, you can see that it corresponds to the hyperacetylation uh, of histones to A and to B, and partially histone 4 inside the tumor, but not in the hippocampus. So these histones, histone uh, 2A in particular, uh, the level of deacetylation corresponds with the high level of acetylase, uh, deacetylase activity of H.4 in particular. So in a similar uh, thing we saw in the uh, U87 gliomas, um, I'm not gonna repeat that in the interest of time, but you can see that uh, the images that are obtained from these tumors localized in the uh, lower basal temporal uh, areas uh, are consistent with the images that we uh, see on the immunohistic chemistry. So it is important to demonstrate that we not only can visualize those, um, uh, the activity of those enzymes, but also uh, monitor in a theranostic type of approach 
uh, treatment with the cold inhibitors. In this case, these are the images before of the same rat. For example, here is the nucleus accumbens area. Here's the tumor itself, and here's the cerebellum. Um, and in this case, uh, this is the uh, minor glioma, I believe. And uh, uh, this animal was later treated and imaged after administration of single dose of MC1568, which is a very highly specific inhibitor for uh, class 2A enzymes. So you can see that uh, because of the higher blood brain barrier permeability in the tumor, most of the effect after administration of that dose is seen in the area of the tumor by virtue of almost complete elimination of the signal. And here's the quantitation of that signal before and after treatment with that specific inhibitor. Yet, if the same animal several uh, days, two or three days later, was treated with a sirtuin 3 inhibitor, which is of different uh, class of HDAC inhibitors, uh, there was no change in the radio tracer accumulation indicating that the level of activity of HDAX class 2A was uninhibited. So here's the conclusions to this uh, last part of my presentation is that molecular genetic imaging of epigenetic regulation by histone deacetylases is feasible with such isotype specific radio tracers as uh, FAHA or trifluorohexanoic analyte, which we call TFAHA, that is now in the process of translation into the clinic with the pre-IND almost completed and we'll start the phase one clinical trials uh, uh, probably early next year. It can be used to develop and optimize therapeutic doses of uh, the HDAC inhibitors by imaging the pharmacodynamics at the target enzyme level. And it could be used to understand the involvement of the epigenetic regulatory mechanisms involved in the development of the uh, end progression of various types of cancers. So these are but only few um, areas where the molecular genetic imaging either already does influence the standard of care or helps to develop novel uh, approaches to treatment of cancers. With that, I will conclude and I'm uh, uh, looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Dr. Jalavani, uh, thank you uh, so much for really a fascinating uh... Uh, presentation in three different areas of molecular imaging and cancer, really molecular therapeutics and cancer. Um, so we have a couple of minutes, some questions. Maybe I'll just then I'll encourage people to put their question in the chat. I also want to uh, acknowledge and thank Dr. Arap, uh, who uh, um, uh, facilitated uh, your invitation here today and uh, with Dr. Deaver, uh, our vice chair. Um, uh, just to go back to the, the, to the CAR T cells that have the reporter genes, and using the radio tracers to identify localization and state of activation. Um, is, is there, are there differences between different tumor types in terms of the timing of uh, using the radio tracer? How does that play out? Or is it really kind of you know, one, one uh, time frame for all? Well, time frame uh, is sort of standard and it's determined not by the uh, cancer subtype or type, uh, but rather by the pharmacokinetics of the radio tracer distribution. Uh, we typically administer the radio tracer and image at about 40 minutes to an hour after the radio tracer administration to allow for sufficient clearance of non-localized uh, to the target, obviously, non-localized uh, uh, radioactivity, um, either through hepatobiliary or the uh, renal pathways. Uh, yet, uh, the question uh, probably I will rephrase uh, um, it, it may be it may be more relevant to ask whether what time for imaging should be utilized in different cancers, uh, depending on what radio uh, what the immunotherapeutic approach is being used. Well, so literally, question. this question could be answered very simply at the discretion of what time points you are uh, looking to, because we really don't know yet what is the spatial and temporal dynamics of T cells upon injection into the body. A lot of studies have demonstrated that within probably two to three hours, the T cells localize first to the lung as the first sort of seeding event. And then if you image early on after infusion of cells with the radio tracer, an image hour later or two or three hours post infusion, uh, most of these cells will be in the lung. 
uh, if you image those perhaps you know three to four days later, now you start seeing their localization in the immune checkpoint organs, thymus, spleen, lymph nodes, especially the draining lymph nodes from the tumor and the tumor itself. And thereafter, you can monitor as frequently as the radiation dosimetry would allow. With the fluorine, you can probably have, uh, with the fluorine 18, uh, about three to four imaging studies with the 10 millicury uh, every time being administered over the course of one month without exceeding monthly radiation doses. So that would yeah. allow you to stagger the studies in frequency that will address questions that are relevant to immune uh, uh, cell uh, trafficking. Thanks so much. That's exactly really what I was asking about the uh, the activation of the of the of the CAR T cells, right? Thanks so much. Um, and the localization, right? Oh, any other? We I think we have time for one more question. If anybody else would like to either put that in the chat or unmute themselves, please go ahead. Well, I think you gave us a lot to think about today. Really, the, the science and the translational science of this is really fascinating. And uh, uh, it's really wonderful to see all the advances that have occurred over time. And uh, congratulations to you and to your group uh, that have done so much in this arena. I really, really appreciate that. And uh, thank you again for joining us this morning. Thank you. My pleasure. And uh, if anybody will have any questions, my email is provided there. I'll be more than glad to answer. Thank you, and thank you, everybody, for uh, joining this uh, Grand Rounds. I wish you a uh, great rest of the day. Have a good one. Take care. Thank you again. Bye-bye.